Welcome to the Fabulous 413. I'm Khalees Smith. And I'm Monty Belmonte. Later in the show, a look at the Caribbean's musical melting pot, Salsa. DJ Bongo Head and band leader Jose Gonzalez are hosting an event that explores the history of the genre in music and dance in Northampton this Sunday. And we'll reveal City Space East Hampton's innovative way of incubating arts with their Pay It Forward program with the program's new director Zoe Fieldman and previous grant recipient and current board member Kim Chin Givens. Yes, Gibbons. That's okay. Gibbons. Gibbons. We got it. Yesterday on the show, we welcomed Catherine Gabron from Lighthouse School in Holyoke, and Catherine wanted to correct some numbers she left us with. She wrote to say, quote, It seems I may have conflated the four-year graduation rate in Holyoke High School, which was 60% in 2015, with the dropout rate, which was max 15%. But I made it sound like it was a 40% dropout rate. So thank you for that correction, Catherine. And now we go off to D.C. Hey, how are you? Good, and you? Everything is beautiful. Everything is great. <laughs> All the big <laughs> legislation's passed. You got nothing to do for the rest of the year. Yeah, I don't know what to, you know, I'll see whether Speaker Johnson's still speaker in a week or two. But, but no, we have to do our appropriations bills. We have to keep the government running. Oh, yeah. So that's, the other, that's our next big thing. That sounds important, too. Think we should get uh, Jim and Marjorie from Boston Public Radio to come out on the march? Yeah, no, you, you, Joe Kennedy grabbed me. He said he talked to, he talked to them on the air and... I, I don't know how he. I don't know how he got brought up. He just called me. He said, "Yeah, they said they, they'll be there." I guess the last time he was on their show, he was live on the march, like calling in. He did their show the day I called you. Was that yesterday or the day before? Yeah, something like um, that. And he mentioned it on their show. He said, "Yeah, well, I guess uh, Jim and Marjorie think that Western Mass is all just Tanglewood, and I guess strip clubs. Yeah. So it'd yeah, be, well, it'd be, it'd okay. be good to show them the yeah, real we Western can, Mass. We can prove them wrong. Yeah, right? but we should also it's stop at the Waitley problem. Ballet <laughs> now that it's reopened again. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Time for our weekly check-in with U.S. Congressman from the 2nd Congressional District of Massachusetts, Worcester's own Congressman Jim McGovern. There were a bevy of big votes that happened this week that have now been signed into law by the President of the United States. National security votes is how they've been sort of packaged. And you released a statement publishing your explanations on your votes. For funding for Ukraine, you voted yes. For funding for Indo-Pacific, you voted yes. For the ban on TikTok, which has been looped into this as a national security threat, you voted no. And for Israel funding, you voted no. You want to go one by one through these and talk a little bit about why you voted the way you did? All right. Uh, Well, one is I'm glad we were able to separate the packages and people got to express themselves on on each individual uh, issue. But on Ukraine, look, I, I, I really do believe that, you know, this is a pivotal moment for Ukraine. Vladimir Putin was making um, some gains. And I think if Putin prevails in Ukraine, it's not the end. And, uh, you know, for all those people who are talking about, oh, well, every just, everybody should just negotiate an end to this. Well, fine. But Putin has no incentive to negotiate uh, an end to this because Donald Trump has basically sided with him. I, I think this is essential uh, in order to prevent Putin from a victory which will not end in Ukraine, which will spread to other countries. So that's why I voted a yes on that. On the TikTok, I think it's I think it's a bad idea to ban TikTok. Quite frankly, if the issue is the protection of data, you can ban TikTok a hundred times. You know, the bottom line is that uh, if China wants our data, they can pay a data broker to get it. You know, we ought to be looking at how you protect people's data. Uh, rather than banning a whole, uh, you know, social media platform. There was I'm a political sure article, too, in... saying that this could have um, implications for U.S. jobs as well. I mean, this is not... Uh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. because there are people who, whose businesses rely on, on TikTok. This is not just about young people being able to access to TikTok. Yeah, that's an important thing as well. But th- there are people's businesses built kind of around this platform. And again, I'm not sure it will stand scrutiny in the courts. But anyway, for some reason, they decided to, to throw this on this package. And so, you know, I voted no on that. On the Israel stuff, look, I, I, I consider myself a, a friend of Israel. I believe in the, the security of Israel. But I, I think Netanyahu has been a disaster. I think what happened on October 7th, the attack on Israel was unconscionable. And the taking of hostages is, is a war crime. There's got to be released. But what Netanyahu is doing, I think, is more about his own self-preservation than about what's good for Israel, um, uh, you know, or good for, or for good for peace. The counter war that he has launched in Gaza, what was 33,000 people dead? I mean, we see the pictures of children, you know, elderly people. These aren't combatants. Uh, we have, there's a famine happen, uh, unfolding. It's getting worse. New York Times says today it's getting worse. I mean, we're just going to sit by and let people just starve to death. Um, and how is that in anybody's security interest? You know, it just further divides the world and 
further jeopardizes Israel's own security. I mean, we need a ceasefire now. The hostages ought to be released. You know, we ought to get humanitarian aid into Gaza as soon as possible to, to prevent this famine from getting worse. You know, there was some aid for Gaza included in this package. Is there any meaningful aid from what you've seen? It could be meaningful aid because some of that humanitarian aid could go to Gaza. The problem is it's not that there's not money for humanitarian aid. It is getting humanitarian aid into Gaza. I mean, it has been frustrated uh, by Israel um, at the borders. We're told more trucks are going in, but relief organizations are telling me the trucks are half full, a quarter full. Uh, some of them are being diverted to other, uh, away from where it needs to go to other places. It's it's not that we don't have the money for humanitarian aid. It's getting it to the people who need it. Uh, and that's why this ban on UNRWA was so unfortunate. I mean, you know, we're, we're still waiting to see the evidence that UNRWA somehow is tied into Hamas, which we have seen no evidence of that. But they actually have the personnel and the people and the capability and the know-how to get aid to where it needs to go. And as we've seen with groups like World Central Kitchen, our friend Jose Andres' group, I mean, even when they coordinated with the Israelis, you have seen that their convoys have been targeted and their employees have been, uh, have been killed. So this is a very perilous situation. And, you know, I think giving Netanyahu a blank check to be able to continue this, I think is a mistake. And by the way, the issue is not just in Gaza. We also have to pay attention to what's happening on the West Bank. We're told that Tony Blinken, Secretary of State, may be issuing a prohibition on military aid to some mili Israeli military units on the West Bank for their human rights violations against Palestinians. That will be unprecedented if that happens. Mm -hmm. That's the Leahy law. But look, we got to be figuring out a way to stop the bombing and to start figuring out what the long-term solution is. Endless war is not going to do anything but further inflame the region, jeopardize Israel's security, and more Palestinians will die. Speaking with U.S. Congressman Jim McGovern, things have settled down on the campus of Smith College, where there was a, a pro-Palestinian encampment. But at Columbia University in New York, Emerson in Boston, other college campuses, protests have been leading to arrests, including the daughter of one of your colleagues, Ilhan Omar. Do you feel like these uh, arrests and mass uh, measures are warranted? Do you think it's too extreme? Speaker Johnson was at Columbia, I believe, yesterday, saying that they should be calling in the National Guard. Yeah, I don't think Speaker Johnson's appearance at Columbia did anything to calm anything. It was there to inflame and to try to further politicize all of this. Look, the people who are protesting, I think the vast majority, the overwhelming majority are doing so because they are heart sick and really horrified by what's unfolding before their very eyes. There are some, let's be honest, that are interjecting themselves in these protests. Many of them who are not even you know, members of the student body who have different agendas. And some of them, quite frankly, are anti-Semitic, and we ought to condemn that. I mean, no matter what we feel about what's happening in um, in Gaza right now, I mean, especially those of us who believe that Israel, that Netanyahu is wrong, I mean, we have an obligation to condemn anti-Semitism where, wherever it, it may appear. Look, you know, I'm a believer in protest, but, you know, there are rules. Sometimes people cross the line because they want to get arrested. I've I've been arrested four times. I knew when I went into these protests you know, what was going to happen if I crossed a certain line. And I did, and it resulted in my arrest. The other thing is I do think that people have a right to be able to go to class and to be able to have a college experience as well. To demonize these protesters the way we, we now see is happening, I think, is, is a mistake. To the extent that we can resolve this stuff on college campuses with college authorities, I think is preferable. You know, again, many of them, the vast majority of them are doing this because they, they want the violence to end and they don't want the United States, their government, to be fueling a, a situation that will create more violence. One of the things that's on Congress's docket in the next few weeks is the Federal Aviation Authority reauthorization it needs to happen by May 10th, which would renew the Aviation Agency's statutory authority. And we got an aviation-related listener question from Mike McIntyre, who I believe works at Franklin County Tech School in Turner's Falls. He wants to know from you, is there any way to get aviation school programs moved up the FAA priority list? Franklin County Tech is ready to start an aviation maintenance program, but the FAA is so backlogged they don't have a time frame to get the program approved. He says as an aviation professional and a school committee member, school programs like these should get priority to help the growing need in the aviation industry. And if you don't know the layout of Franklin County Tech, it's right next to an airport in Turner's Falls. Do you have any sway with the FAA? You sit on any of these committees that this could be something that could potentially be bumped up? 
Well, I, yeah, I mean, it's something I'm happy to look into. Uh, I don't know a lot of detail about about the issue, but uh, I'm happy to reach out to the FAA to see what they can bump this stuff up. So, uh, you know, maybe he can get a hold of my office and, and give me the specific details uh, that he's dealing with, and uh, and I'm happy to follow up. Okay, great. I'll connect you with uh, your office with Mike, who sent that listener question, and let's see yeah. what can happen. You have till May 10th, it looks like, so you get well, the hurry up. That's not much time. <laughs> Earlier this morning, I was texting uh, back and forth with our friend Ben Clark, fruit farmer from Clarkdale Fruit Farm, to check on the status of the peaches with the cold weather last night. Good news is it looks okay. But uh, you were working with Senator Gene Shaheen to uh, halt a proposal from the USDA about apple crop insurance that would have hurt New England growers. Can you tell us what that uh, proposal was and why you decided you needed to stop yeah. it? Well, I, I, it was a meeting that I think Ben Clark and others you know, organized uh, for me, I think it was months ago now, talking to me about uh, you know, some of the special hardships that would happen um, you know, if, if this were to go forward. And so uh, working with Gene Shaheen, we were able to intervene and, uh, and help our apple growers. I mean, the bottom line is that, as you know, I mean, our farms, especially in Western Massachusetts, uh, are an important part of our economy. And I don't want people going out of business. I don't want people, you know, having to um, lay people off or to not produce as much. Um, you know, I have a very active agriculture advocacy community. And by that, I mean our farmers who reach out to us all the time and um, and we, we, we work with them. And, and again, in, in this case, I think we, they were able to respond in a way that was favorable to our apple growers. But oftentimes in Washington, what ends up happening is that there's a focus on these big mega farms. And they forget these small and medium-sized farms, uh, which to me are, are, you know, again, are important to the economies of places like Massachusetts and New Hampshire. Another thing you were busy with this week was the second annual Food as Medicine Conference at Tufts that is sort of an outgrowth of something that you helped to convene, which was the first in a generation White House Conference on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health happened uh, in the fall of, of 2022. Uh, how are the students at Tufts uh, relating to food as medicine as part of their academic studies? Yeah, well, it's not just students. This conference you know, brought in people from all across the country and including people from the administration. Look, we need to, we, we need to move our health care system in a direction where we understand the importance of food as medicine. Bad nutrition results in bad health. That's only bad for individuals, but it's costly to our healthcare system. And so, I mean, this is about, you know, things that we need to do, things that we can do to move in that direction. We talked about the need to get our medical schools to educate future doctors in nutrition. Currently, that is not a requirement. We, we need to move in that direction. We're talking about medically tailored meals for people who, you know, who get dismissed from hospitals that will help them Heal. We're talking about food prescriptions. You know, we're talking about the importance of integrating nutrition into our public school system and making sure the quality of meals are better. It was a whole bunch of stuff that we talked about yesterday. It's continuing today. But the focus is advocacy. What do we want the insurance industry to do? What do we want, you know, our states to do, our local communities to do? So this is important. I mean, the good news here is that this conference that we did a year and a half ago now is actually producing results. And we are slowly but surely moving in the direction that we all said we want to move in. Well, this ties in nicely to our final point here today. It's not quite a, a listener question, but first of all, I go through a lot of the comments on the posts that you put on social media and the vitriol <laughs> on almost anything you know. that you do is it's off the charts. I can't imagine having to experience yeah. that day in and day out. So I will I will leave you with this little tidbit of goodness <laughs> for you to take with you the rest of your day, Congressman McGovern. Yeah. We got a, an email from a woman named Judy who said that she marched with us on the March for the Food Bank last November, but that she's a co-organizer of Team WAMDA, the Western Area Mass Dietetics Association, which is a voluntary nonprofit association that promotes optional nutritional and well-being for the community and working with nutrition professionals on this issue that you've been talking about at Tufts that we've been talking about for years now. And uh, she wanted everybody to know that there is a Walk for Hunger on May 5th Project Bread has their mother walk for hunger each year in May and the Boston Common and WAMDA is collaborating uh, with that because they are responsible for getting universal free meals passed and other Massachusetts legislation that's worked to help alleviate hunger in the area. But she ended her ask to announce this march on the air by sending a picture of her and you on the food bank march saying, that's my picture with my idol, Jim McGovern. Oh. Thanks, Judy Dowd. So at least 
one person in the internet <laughs> sphere is admiring what you're doing. And I thought I should, uh, well, since she shared that with me, I figured I would share that with you. Well, that means, a, that means, that means a lot to me. And, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of negative stuff on social media, but you know what? I, I, I think there are a lot more people out there who share the concerns on this issue of hunger and, and nutrition that you and I have talked about and marched about for, for many, many years. I mean, look, we have a chance to do something important, something that will improve the quality of life for people uh, in this country, and the added benefit will save a boatload of money and avoidable health care costs. Why don't we just move in that direction? And so what we're all trying to do is hurry things along. But anyway, I really appreciate it. that. means a lot to me. Congressman Jim McGovern joins us every week. You can send questions or, I guess, fan mail or hate mail even to the uh, to the congressman <laughs> through me at thefab413 at nepm.org. Talk to you again soon. All the best. Thanks. Coming up, how cities-based East Hampton is supporting under-resourced performing arts in the region. But up next, a preview of the History of Salsa event happening in Northampton this Sunday. We'll be joined by Pablo Iglesias, a.k.a. DJ Bongo Head, and Jose Gonzalez. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on 88.5 NEPM. Sunday, April 28th at 2 p.m. at the Northampton Center for the Arts Flex Space at 33 Holly. It's a history of salsa with DJ Bongo Head and Jose Gonzalez and Banda Criolla. We'll learn about the roots of salsa music, culture, and history from salsa's Cuban, Puerto Rican, Caribbean, and Latin American origins to its explosion as a unifying cultural force in the 60s and 70s in New York City. This does make New York City. New York City. To the worldwide movement it is today. Pablo e. Iglesias, a.k.a. A DJ Bongo Head kicks off the event with a vinyl set and visual projections paired with his deep knowledge of salsa and global music movements. And then next, Jose Gonzalez and Banda Criolla take the stage for a high-energy live set of Latin dance rhythms in celebration of the musical styles of Puerto Rico, Cuba, and Latin America elsewhere. Joining us from the event is Jose Gonzalez and DJ Bongo Head, Peter McQuillan, DJ Quills, assistant producer from the NoHo Arts Council, and Steve Sanderson, producer for the same. Thank you all for joining us. Us. Thanks Thank for you. having us. Come on to you, please. <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah. All right. Salsa. What came first? Salsa the food or salsa the music? <laughs> That's a good one. Salsa the music is later. It came later. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the yeah. word is an old word. It's a Spanish word. Right. right. It means sauce. sauce. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sauce. I just was reading a book about they found some really early references to using the word salsa more of a, you know, like a metaphor for something that is musical and danceable as long ago as the 1890s uh-huh. in Cuban newspapers. Interesting. But definitely, you know, there's some foundational songs that reference the word but didn't call the music that as early as the teens and the 30s. Echale Salsita by Ignacio Piñero, that's from 1930. But yeah, like you were saying in your intro, you kind of did a really good. I stole it all from the Northampton Arts Council <laughs> and the 33 Hollywood. Uh-huh. Oh, so okay. You all did a good job. Good job doing your research, read it. everybody. Good summing up. Yeah. So speaking of that, that 1890s reference. So when are the earliest times that you see salsa in reference to music? Generally speaking, I would say the mid 1960s in Venezuela. There was a. Uh, famous radio show that had a sponsor of a catch-up company th- that was a salsa and the DJ was playing a lot of New York Latin dance music um, Richie Ray and Ray Barreto and so when the people that were listening would request this new music from New York New York City by mostly Puerto Rican musicians uh, on the American labels, they would say, you know, play me a salsa because it was the hour of salsa. That was like the name of the radio <laughs> st- of show. But it didn't really get used as a marketing term uh, in the United States until a little bit later in, in the early 70s when Funnier Records started, you know, using that moniker to describe this current crop of bands and records that were coming out playing this, this danceable Afro-Caribbean music. So you've got two lines of the use of the word salsa, one of which is a metaphor from like the late 1800s. And then uh, because of an advertisement of ketchup, they come <laughs> yeah. together and now have defined this genre. Right? And because of, of the references in the songs, like the, that show, La Hora de la Salsa y Bembe, it, it was also referencing a song by Joe Cuba, Salsa y Bembe. I think the early 60s that song is from, you know, Bembe is a party, salsa is a sort of hot mix of things, you know, just basically 
basically saying like cooking in a jazz parlance. You yeah, know, yeah. Where cooking mm-hmm. now is when the band is really, really well, well oiled and getting very spicy. So this is a little bit of what you're going to get a taste of salsa wise, not in your mouth as much as your ears on Sunday at the Northampton <laughs> Center for the Arts with the history of salsa with DJ Bongo Head, Pablo Iglesias, who we're talking to, and some live salsa music with Jose Gonzalez and Banda Criolla. What drew you to salsa as a musical genre? I'm from Puerto Rico. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> you hear that even uh, if you're playing rock and roll in Puerto Rico, you know, from the Beatles era. Yeah. That was huge. But on the way home from school, I could hear in every house. Every house had salsa, you know. So in Puerto Rico, Rico, um, you're born in my time. We had rockeros y agogos. That means you either played rock or, or salsa. What was the second word? Agogo. 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 From, yeah, oh, yeah. Okay, that. yeah, yeah. Cocolos, you know, they used to call cocolos the kids in high school who used to like the salsa music. Uh-huh. So you always had that. And there's many people who like both. I- I'm an example because I played a lot of rock, yeah. you know, but I've worked with a lot of the salsa artists. From the musician's point of view, uh, salsa, the word musicians are spinning off the food. You yeah. know, of course, uh, la comida rica tiene salsa, as he was mentioning. But there's a lot of controversy even now, you know, among musicians, and I've seen it. Uh, uh, there's two things that musicians always argue. The origins of salsa, because different countries like to claim, you know, it's my child. No, well, but I raised it. Yeah. You, know, so you had the baby. <laughs> so what? the reality is salsa is Cuban music. All musicians agree the root is Cuban song, style from Cuba, but as he mentioned, it goes to New York, and then it changes. It's not really the, the traditional Cuban music. It has that cosmopolitan New York energy, el bugalú, you know, all these music that was going on. And this influence of Panamanian musicians, Puerto Rican musicians, Dominican musicians, that New York melting pot, mm-hmm. that's where salsa comes from. Or this does make New York City. And it's really a generic term. It's like when we say salsa, we think it of rock. You know, you say rock, you can be thinking a kiss, but you can be thinking a James Taylor. You know, and like <laughs> everybody fits under that umbrella. Yeah. Same thing happens with salsa. That's why it confuses people because we have, you know, it could be cumbia, merengue, bachata, guaguanco, rumba from the traditional rhythms, it's a big stew. It's exactly. almost anything that Latin people like to dance to, <laughs> that's, that you throw that in the pot. There's a famous musician who passed away recently in Puerto Rico. His name was Mañenga. He's the father of Giovanni Dalgo, the famous conga player. I was with Giovanni in a band when he was 16. Few instruments in the world you can say who's the greatest. He's the greatest conga player, you know, acknowledged even by African drummers. His father, I used to drive from rehearsals, and he would have at home, he told me, he, he had a stew going on continuously. I said, you have something cooking in your house. He said, I never turn it off. And he would throw things in there all the time. So I, I just get home and it's, I never turn it off. That's what, I, he lived what salsa was. You throw in anything you like and the music is always evolving. It's always boiling in the pot. And as he mentioned, Fania was huge. Fania Records was like the umbrella company in New York that started bringing in people. You know, Johnny Pacheco was one of the founders. But you had also um, a young Ruben Blades, Willie Colón, everybody, anybody who plays Celia Cruz, Oscar de Leon, from, you know, from different countries in Latin America. And there's a brotherhood. It's, it's really united. These musicians are like brothers. You know, there's no national boundaries when it comes to the music. My band, or Timbalero, who you're going to see on Sunday, if you go to the show, he's a show. Remember, I'm telling you this. this guy. <laughs> and, and he's Cuban. This guy's Cuban. I don't know what they have there. They, they, what are they eating there or something? But they have, like, tienen la música por dentro. They have the music inside them. Mm-hmm. We're going to have a, a Venezuelan piano player, and we have three Puerto Rican musicians. When we get together, there are no boundaries. It's just a brotherhood, and that's the way it is with all all of salsa. That is Jose Gonzalez from Banda Criolla, who is part of the History of Salsa event happening this Sunday at a very friendly time for people that have to get up early on Monday, 2 p.m. in the afternoon. <laughs> right. We're also joined by DJ Bongo head Pablo Iglesias. Dance yourself tired so that you can sleep well. Yeah. You mentioned uh, Salsa Clásica, and I was thinking about like the different forms that salsa can can take that people might be familiar with. Like I know Clásica Endura, um, and I know that there's plenty of others. <laughs> How many forms does salsa take that people might be readily familiar with? Well, even Santana... <laughs> <laughs> has some salsa right. in him and it's funny too because he started out it started out as the Santana blues band blues, right right even though as a young boy he was in a mariachi orchestra with his father playing the violin and that's kind of where his guitar tone came from but he got in with a manager who was not latino was jewish american that was a mambo fanatic in the 50s before he became a rock impresario and that 
manager said, you should cover this Tito Puente song. Mm -hmm. And boom, the rest is history. So you could say, even though it's like Latin rock or maybe even the first world music, even Santana tenía su salsa, right? Mm -hmm. So people would be familiar with that. They would be maybe familiar with Antonio Banderas and the Mambo King Sing Songs of Love, that movie, or other movies. I like it like that. In the 90s, where Tito Nieves sang the Boogaloo song. There's a lot of advertisements out there. They might know Cardi B also. So uh, I like it and turned it into a new hit. The original, I like it like that. I do love that. Because the ballroom dance culture, there's a much wider wider audience, a global audience. And so some people have different la levels of knowledge about it. Maybe they just want to dance to it and they don't want to know the minutiae of the different eras and musicians, but they have to know the clave. They have to know the, the rhythm, but you know, maybe they have a different dance style from a different country too. Well, speaking of the very clave, complex. Pablo Iglesias, DJ oh, yeah. Bongo head, have you, you have a demonstration for us <laughs> in studio. You brought clave with you. So well, uh, I mean, basically, and this, is this is something that is up for debate too, right? Yes. Well, but if you don't have clave, you don't have salsa. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. Sin la clave, no right. hay salsa. Okay. And that was one of the criticisms about Boogaloo. Sometimes it was crucial, what they say, like off clave, because right. it had more of the R and B beat. Although the cha 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 is in a lot of. R&B songs. You just have to hear it. So anyway, there's the two different ones. There's 3-2 and 2-3. Okay, that's one, which goes with the son. And then the somontuno and cha-cha-cha, that is the other way around. Which, if you think, you hear cha-cha, cha-cha-cha. So it's That's the clave, and it's it's these two sticks that uh, maybe originally came from the wooden staves in in the Spanish mm -hmm. ships. It's just uh, it's in African music. It, it was there before, and yeah. it just got sort of translated. You yeah, know, I wanted to mention Jose something. Gonzalez. The clave we when we said the word salsa and that there was a little bit of controversy because some people claim you know it came from this word. There are a lot of variations. The clave that. I've seen fights in the studio. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. Uh, uh, the clave, even though it looks simple, this is what throws musicians around the world off of Latino music. If you don't understand the clave, I've been in rehearsals where the conga player will stop and yell at a piano player, ta cruzao, that means you're crossed. And I could not hear this. You know, I was, I was a rocker and I, I went to the conservatory, classical. I'll tell you one thing, half of the people in the Conservatory of Music of Puerto Rico when I was there didn't understand the clave. You have to feel it. This music is from the heart. I love that. And, and uh, people assume if you're from Puerto Rico, everybody knows salsa and they can dance it. No, I started dancing with my partner, Susan, who's from Springfield. And she, I was a musician who played salsa, but I was always involved in arranging and stuff, so I never got out on the floor. And it's very important for people to go out and feel the music. It's a beautiful music. People are dancing it around the world. There's a good reason for it, because once you dance it, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Up next, more clave controversy and how the clave inspired one of rock and roll's most famous beats. Plus, we'll learn why dance is such an important part of salsa music. And later, an opportunity for artists in East Hampton and beyond. We'll talk to Zoe Fieldman and Kim Chen Gibbons about City Space's Pay It Forward program. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on 88.5 NEPM. Welcome back to the Fabulous 413. More with the folks behind this Sunday's History of Salsa Music event happening at 33 Holly, DJ Bongo Head, and Jose Gonzalez. Now, the clave, he mentioned there's clave dos tres, clave tres dos, clave de rumba. You know, there's even a Brazilian clave that they have in Brazil. It's a variation. It's the Bo Diddley beat. If you yep. play rock and roll, the Rolling Stones used it. Everybody, it's a cool rhythm, you know, boom, 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 da -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. That is the clave, three, two. There's clave two, three, and musicians in the studio, I've left the studio, leaving the guys, the music director and somebody else arguing. I recently saw a video of um, uh, Tony Sucar from from uh, Peru, and he had two musicians in his record. This is a grand, he's, he's been producer of the year uh, in he Latin just, he music. He just did a salsa album with Sheila E. Yes, he, cool. he's hot. This guy's great, I saw him. He's the best thing happening. Very young guy, incredible arranger, and... Um, 
he, he, he had a, a music, an arranger from Cuba and an arranger from Puerto Rico. And they started, the guy says, well, I know clave. You know, the other guy's like up with his headphones on in the conga. Yeah, pero yo soy cubano. Tú sabes, like, you know, we own this thing. And, and, and everybody, you know, they were, and they were arguing. So people shouldn't feel bad if, you, if you're not a Latino and you don't understand it, don't worry. Because even they have arguments. And the other thing is I used to see all the singers in salsa. I thought, oh, Ruben Blades thinks he's cool. He's always snapping his fingers, you know, oh, mamita, you know. <laughs> and then in salsa music, if you listen to it, after they do the main part of the song, they go into the mambo part, just like jazz musicians say the head. You, if you, you can't play salsa unless you know the lingo, you know, when you're playing in a band. or uh, They say mambo uno, mambo do, la moña, you know, uh, la clave, el montuno. Si, el montuno, la cabeza, el, la coda. And, you know, the signals are like just a fist. Eddie Palmieri, you know, his fist, that means we're out of here, you know. So, you know, and like a classical musician is, where, where, where's that on the paper? There's nothing on the paper. You got to know the culture of music if you're playing jazz. Same thing with rock and roll. You go play with some guys and you got to know your Clapton and your John Bonham. You know, you got to know your Keith Moon. You have to know your stuff. And, and classical music, the same thing. One of the main reasons that you have to stick to the clave is for the dancers, because as in any African-based music, it's not just about one thing or the other. The dance and the music go together. And there's many stories where... Tito Puente gets all messed up when he's playing because he sees a dancer who's dancing off clave. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it messes up everybody that's trying to play the music on clave. It's just like the phrase, like, friends don't let friends clap on one and three. Yes. Like, don't show up oh, yeah. doing this. I agree. Yes. Um, when you were talking about Ruben Blades like, and singing, like, I feel like any any musical style, any style that's pretty close to like African, yeah. to its African roots, if you can't snap while you're mm. you're singing, like, you're probably off. Right. The beat, like, beats, you're not feeling the where, beats have to where the beat is. Yeah. Like clave is a heart. It is a heartbeat. This is just well, that's a, why the boogaloo was just freeform dance. Yeah. And that's what made some people a little bit upset. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> it was an awesome moment of experimentation. It was one of the it's like jazz, it's one of the original American musical art forms. So nowhere else did it get born. And then, sadly, you know, it died a few years later for a complex of reasons. I'm not sure what Jose has planned for his musical programming, but when I when I DJ, I'll play a cha-cha-cha, and then I'll mm -hmm. play a boogaloo, and I'll say you can kind of dance the same. As long as the boogaloo is in clave, yeah. which some were, you can kind of dance the same steps. But, the, uh, you know, one thing just to talk about Sunday, there's an educational aspect, but it is not a sit-down lecture. Right. It's a stand up and dance lecture. <laughs> it's going to be a fun yes. lecture. It's going to be a fun lecture. Yeah, fun. I was going to ask, are you planning in your sets, each of you, uh, to move us through time from the origins of, of Salsa through to the present and what you're going to be bringing on mm -hmm. Sunday? We're going like we're gonna to do uh, the rhythms, whether it's cha-cha-cha, salsa, rumba, merengue, bachata, cumbia. You know, we're going to talk a little bit what you should be listening for. If you come and you're a beginner dancer, as he mentioned, cha-cha-cha is a good place to start because you can count. You know, if you're not really that groovy all over the place with your body, you start with that. The bachata, you can move to. Merengue is, even in Puerto Rico, you know, you see the dance halls, the people that don't dance a lot. When they play a merengue, everybody gets up. Everybody you know? gets up. He, he, he only, knows that. It's only two. Yeah. You don't have yeah, it's to only one, two, else. one, two. So don't be shy. You know, get up there. The other thing is, because it's a fun music, people are out, out there to have fun. Yeah. You know, it's not a dance competition. Right. It's not like American Idol where, you know, you're going to lose or anything like that. It's really to have fun. And once you join in, people are very accepting, you know. I would tell people as a, as, a, as a late comer to the dance world, you know, I would tell people to join in because I wanted to know as a musician what it felt. I could see all the people having fun. We're up here playing chords and melodies and, you know, beats. So I wanted to experience because I said, yeah, they, they look like they're having a, more fun than the musicians are. <laughs> the original idea maybe came about when, when I was doing um, the salsa um, in the summer with these folks. Salsa in the park. Salsa in the park. 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 Thank you. And just for the heck of it, I was shouting out before each song like a little bit of what the beat was or where the music was from. And so that kind of was part of the kernel. And then also Jose and Banda Criolla were set to play as part of the salsa right. park. And then there was an insane rainstorm. It rained Thunder. a storm. <laughs> so we had to pick up all the equipment, yeah. So this oh, no. time we're indoors. <laughs> this time we'll do it. Yes. And it's a nice Sunday afternoon, so bring, yeah. bring your grandma, bring your child, whatever, and just hang out. 
but yeah, not we're not going to be super academic. It's it's an no, experiential not. thing. It's quite a stew that goes on in the Caribbean. You know, besides the beautiful beaches, there's a lot of the culture that's very rhythm. It's a life of rhythm, and that's what you're going to feel when you go there. Someday and it's not separate. You know, I mean, there was there's all kinds of crossovers. <laughs> it's only when nationalism comes in. For instance, with with merengue, there there was the dictator Trujillo in in the Dominican Republic that wanted to. F- make some music his own for his own propagandistic reasons, but like the oldest piece of written merengue comes from Puerto Rico, from like 1840 or something, but then there's the Haitian merengue, and there's merengues in other countries that are different beats. Everybody tries to claim something, but at the same time, we really are, like he says, we're sibling participants in in a group experience in a kind of ritualistic, you know, it's the descendant of a more like religious thing. People say, oh, it's just folklore, (laughs) or whatever, but it really does have a spiritual aspect. Especially there's a lot of hidden African spiritualism in salsa tunes. Oh yeah. That's another layer and if people can just at least soak it up experientially and then maybe that will interest them later. They can do some more investigation or something. DJ Bongo Head who will be spinning records as part of this history of salsa music and Jose Gonzalez from Bando Criolla who will be playing live salsa music on Sunday. Tell us all the details. Assistant producer from the Northampton Arts Council, Peter McQuillan. Yeah, it's uh, this Sunday, April 28th at 2 p.m., we have a salsa matinee, and it's all happening at the Flex Space at 33 Holly in Northampton. More information and tickets at NorthamptonArtsCouncil.org. Like Pablo said, a lot of people will be familiar with the Salsa in the Park series we do. Is every- that happening again? Yeah, it ask. happens every summer okay, in Pulaski good. Park, so we're doing it in uh, August and September. And, um, you know, as a DJ, I own records that Pablo has written the liner notes on, you know, about the history of this music. So it's really cool that we got it. And you on your show, too. Yep. Uh, on WMUA? WMUA, every Monday night, 6 to 8 p.m. Nice. That's me. And one more shameless plug, Peace and Rhythm, the record label that you're a part of, and as is Bex Taylor, our uh, NEPM DJ, has uh, a record that talks about the kind of unheard history of salsa, the non-fania. <laughs> I produced this, but it's um, for the new owners of Ansonia Records which is a historic record label from New York owned by um, Ralph Perez originally, a Puerto Rican empresario that lived in Manhattan. Uh, It's called Salsa con Estilo, which means salsa with style. And it basically shows you the arc of uh, the roots of salsa through the salsa boom of the recordings coming from this particular label, which was not a big label. Everybody who studies salsa, you know, knows about Fania, knows about the big labels in New York that controlled the airwaves and controlled the contracts and basically had all the famous artists. However, there were lots of mom and pop, smaller labels that came from El Barrio. So this one, Ansonia, mm-hmm. which now has a current a new owner, they allowed me to go into their archives and make this compilation. I'll okay. be playing some of that on Sunday, too. Does the Northampton nice. Arts Council have plans to do more in-depth historical dance parties, I guess, is the way I'm describing <laughs> this? So yes. It's it's right. the, the first concept. of many. Peter McQuillan, DJ Quills, the assistant producer of the Northampton Arts Council, and DJ Bongo Head, Pablo Iglesias, who will be spinning tunes, Jose Gonzalez, who will be playing tunes live with Banda Criolla, and a huge shout-out to Steve Sanderson, who's in the corner over there. <laughs> <laughs> the producer of the Arts Council. It's all happening on Sunday at 33 Holly in Northampton. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. See Thank you. you. Gracias. Go get your dancing. Another fun affair happening at the Northampton Center for the Arts the night before the History of Salsa. It's called Revelry at 33, a fundraiser for the Center for the Arts. It's like an adult prom with live music from now that Now's the Time Jazz Trio, hors d'oeuvres and desserts from Seth Meyers Catering, and signature cocktails mixed up by Kayla Manzi from the Majestic Saloon. Le Mix will play a set in the new Flex Space to get everyone dancing the night before you would get dancing at the salsa event. You can dance both nights. Both nights. You don't have to relegate your dancing to one night. Or one night and one afternoon, I guess. Well, yeah, right. That works. Yeah. Up next, supporting the arts, the next town over, we'll hear about City Space East Hampton's Pay It Forward program with program manager Zoe Fieldman and former recipient Kim Chin Gibbons. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on 88.5 NEPM. The Fabulous 413 podcast is funded by Northeast Solar, homegrown in Hatfield, Massachusetts, and providing energy savings for their customers for over 10 years. Learn more at northeast-solar.com. Welcome back to the Fabulous 413. City Space East Hampton has a great opportunity for artists in Hampshire, Hampden, and Franklin counties to access the Blue Room in Old Town Hall for rehearsals, performances, and a whole lot more. It's called Pay It Forward. The program focuses on supporting under-resourced performing artists in the region and has been a great way to connect peer artists from throughout the three counties. 
The short-term residencies include financial support, one-on-one coaching, and peer-to-peer learning in hopes of deepening their practice, building new skills and relationships, and exploring new ideas. And with us are two of the folks involved with the program. Zoe Fieldman is the new City Space Art Programming and Venue Manager. Zoe comes to City Space from Brooklyn, a graduate of Mount Holyoke College. Zoe recently served as the Stage Manager and Technical Director for the Queer Community Theater's Bar Dykes, a pay-it-forward project at City Space. When they are not at City Space, they also work as a cheesemonger. Yes! I mean, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. That's that's absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Zoe is City Space for, uh, Space's first arts programming and venue manager where they look forward to growing their work and uh, helping underrepresented artists share their stories. Kim Chin Gibbons is a Pay It Forward recipient from 2022 and is a 2024 City Space Artist Advisory Committee member. Kim is a Cambodian-born, American-raised artist based in Amherst. She composes baritone guitar rock and is part of the band Sunset Mission, who you heard at the intro here. Leaving traditional school at age 14, led her to find her love of music, photography, and marketing for the arts and nonprofits, the work that she's been knee deep in independently for more than half a decade. Kim is an alum of North Star Self Directed Learning for Teens, which we talked a little bit about on yesterday's show, Mm -hmm. and the Institute for Musical Arts in Goshen, which we love their summer programs. Kim attended Marlboro College in Marlboro, Vermont, who merged with Emerson in Boston. Kim has worked at both Northampton Music Stores, Downtown Sounds, and Mill River Music and freelances in photography. Personal note, she also gave my son Enzo guitar lessons. (laughs) That is not why we invited you on the show, Kim. (laughs) How did he do, though? Amazing. Star student. Nice. Seriously. (laughs) He never plays guitar for me. He won't do it. Oh. Come on, Enzo. He doesn't have have to to play for you. I know. Yeah, the the guitar is for him. Anyway, (laughs) um, this is a new program. I believe it's only in its, like, second or third year? Second year? third year. Third year. Yeah. Um, We had one of the recipients of uh, the grant last year on our show, Red Jasper, for their Queertivity program, which happened, which was super, super cool. But tell us a little bit more about the the impetus for the program and allowing artists to have access to space, which is in short supply in the area. Oh, yeah. So basically, our goal is to bridge the three counties of Western Massachusetts. So we got Hampshire County, Hamden County, and Franklin County members are all welcome to apply for this program. And we are trying to really bridge that gap in both location and space and resources between all the counties into channeling it all into one place in the Blue Room in City Space in East Hampton, where we feel like we're also in a nice kind of like pinpoint right in the middle of all three. So we're easy to get to and fun to come see. Uh, talk about the blue room space in as it is. Like, what kind of space is it? What can be done there? What have you seen done there? Yeah. So it's a true DIY space. Uh, right now, it operates mostly via rentals, and we are also moving more towards doing collaborative partnership events too. So if your project doesn't get chosen for Pay It Forward, that does not mean it's the end of the road for that project. There's many different channels that can get you on the stage in the Blue Room. It's a 200 standing, roughly 130 seated audience uh, venue. We have a projector, we have a PA system, you can put lights and sound up. It's also a fully ADA accessible stage. We have a wheelchair ramp up to the stage and a wheelchair entrance to the building itself. Um, That's one of the things that we are really aiming to do is to break down all of those barriers to access the artists might face and getting themselves and their bodies and their work on that stage. And the rest is our job to do. Uh, Kim Chin, Chin Gibbons, I'm so, I don't know why, it's the NG that ends up being really difficult for me, and I apologize. I just used to love to say Kim Chin Gibbons. I would say, Enzo, you're going to take guitar lessons with Kim Chin Gibbons? Because the rhythm of it is just so it's wonderful. It's wonderful, yeah. but my tongue just trips, and I'm so sorry. But you're a recipient of this grant of the inaugural year. What was it like putting on a performance there, and what did you do with your grant? It was amazing. I mean, I remember seeing the performance application program and I was just like, this is real. (laughs) So I applied for a residency and when we got it, um, Sunset Mission, I chose to do the residency with Sunset Mission and we made a music video the first day and then we were in tech all the next day and then we had a performance and bookending the weekend was just like so many like creation of media like we did a we had a photographer, we had a videographer do live videos and it was just Kind of the best thing ever. <laughs> a quick thing about Sunset Mission. If you love like prog rock and metal, 
and <laughs> also like beautiful singer songwriter music. It is this wonderful like hybrid mashup of that. Oh, thank yeah, you. Yeah, so it's really like, <laughs> which are two things that I like. When I was a kid, I was so into metal and prog rock, and then as a grown up, I've been more into the singer songwriter thing. It, it all comes together in Sunset Mission. <laughs> you so it spans all of your interests. It's totally, and so the program is called Pay It Forward. And it has been paid forward to you, Kim. And now you're part of the committee that will pay it forward to the next uh, recipients of this. How many recipients and what are you kind of looking for for this next round? Yeah, so we're going to do up to 10 recipients. Yeah, Yeah, this is Zoe here speaking. We're going to do up to 10 recipients. Unclear exactly. It a little depends on how many people apply um, and how many people we're able to give this project too, but roughly about 10. Last year, we did 17, which was amazing and awesome and was a little bit much to handle. And so we're going to scale back a little bit so we can make sure we really give everyone the attention and the resources that they deserve, which also means we're able to give up to a $1,000 stipend per project too, as well as the space, as well as the ticketing. 90% of ticket sales are going to go to the performer, though we're going to run the ticketing in the box office, so you don't have to worry about any of that. Um, Yeah. Plug it and play in almost every way. Exactly. But it's not just the the performance and like having access to the space. There's like workshopping amongst the people who are given the grant, who the people whose performances are approved. Like, why is it important to have the people who all of the people who receive this grant kind of know each other and start networking that way? Yeah, I think Kim can really speak to this. It's a wonderful opportunity to meet people. Even after we had the residency, I got to photograph the Play Incubation Collective's performance of Return to Abiella. And that was great because I'm also a photographer. I freelance as well. So also getting artistically connected in other ways was super helpful. Yeah, we're really interested to see not only how we can help artists, how artists can connect with the community of East Hampton and the larger community of Western Massachusetts, but also how artists can connect with each other. It's really a ever-rotating wheel of community aid and mutual resource exchange that we're aiming to do here. Are there any limits to the proposals that people can give you? Like, what if there are people who want to use the space for something that isn't necessarily public performance, is that still okay? So there does have to be a public performance aspect of that, but that can really mean a lot of things. That can mean that there is a talk back, an artist talk back that people can get tickets to go see. It can be a film screening with a Q&A afterwards. It can be a variety show that maybe you are the one recipient of the program, but you put together a burlesque show with many different performers. So Bardex that I was a part of had a cast of about 11 people plus other people pr- involved in the production. The queer community theater was really the recipient of the program itself. Um, So there are many ways that you can make it work. I would love to say that there are no limits. So please give me a reason to say that there are limits because I want your (laughs) most interesting, weirdest, like craziest applications. Um, Send them my way and we'll see we'll see how we can make it work. We're speaking with Zoe Fieldman, who is the new City Space Art Program and Venue Manager at City Space East Hampton, and Kim Chin Gibbons, who is a Pay It Forward recipient from 2022 and is the 2024 City Space Artist Advisory Committee member. What else is happening at City Space? Not to take it away from the grant, but like it's, a, it's an interesting art venue. It's doing a lot. What, what else is happening there? Yeah, there is a lot happening there. We have a few shows coming up this week. Um, we have... Jason Robinson is going to be in the space having a jazz concert. We have a Latin wildfire, Latin dance and music concert. East Hampton Film Festival is going to be in the space during the new East Hampton Art Walk next weekend. There's tons and tons of things to go see. Check out our Instagram at CitySpace413 to see what's coming up. Also our website, CitySpaceEastHampton.org. We have many, many, many things for you to come do and see in our space. So you're looking for 10 recipients of this Pay It Forward program this round. Where do people go? How many people have already applied? And how long do they have to uh, to get this done if they're thinking about it? So applications are due May 6th. Oh, so it's we coming will, right up. It's coming right up. It's right around the corner. We're going to have a recorded Q&A information session that will be available around April 30th if you have any other app application questions. You can also feel free to email us at hello at cityspaceeasthampton.org if you have any questions after hearing my voice. And we are going to announce application recipients on June 10th. 
How long do they have to make the performance happen in the space once the grant's received? So the residency runs anywhere from July to December of this year. And obviously people will not be in the space from July to December, but your program can kind of be anywhere from, like Kim said, hers was about three days long. People have been in the space for a week. Um, There's a big range of what you can do. Very so cool. we Fieldman, the new city space art programming and venue manager, and Kim Chin Gibbons, a Pay It Forward recipient who is paying it forward as a city space artist advisory committee member. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, oh, thank one you. last thing. When would you announce who win? Who who's g- receiving the grants? June tenth. June tenth. Okay. Tomorrow on the fabulous four one three, it's getting towards the end of National Poetry Month, so we break out the big guns. We talk with poet laureate of the whole United States, Ada Limon. She's coming to Smith College next week. And Mr. Universe joins her because she has a poem that's going to Jupiter's Europa, like in actual space. <laughs> we'll also talk with winemaker Patrick Capiello, who wants you to start drinking more locally, and live music Friday with power indie trio True Jackie. This is the music of Kim Chin Gibbons, 7848 single. I'm Monty Belmonte. I'm Khalees Smith. We'll see you tomorrow on the fabulous 413.